I am I'm going to officially start this meeting. This is a meeting of the ETAC Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee on October 7th, 2021. We are meeting virtually um, to stay home and stay safe and all those good things. Um, so just a couple of quick reminders. Um, Try to avoid using the chat function since we can't keep a record of the that. So if you have any, um, if, if you have anything to say or you want to chime in, please just feel free to either raise your hand. I can generally see everybody, um, or uh, use the raise hand function. They've made it real easy. It's just raise hand right there at the bottom. Um, so let's see what's next. Um, this agenda this evening. Um, we're going to go through kind of pick up where we left off. We actually, um, we are going to, I think first off, we're going to, um, once we do the approval of the meet, meeting minutes from last time, I think we are going to have a, a discussion about our new election of our new vice chair. So hopefully some folks have been thinking about that. And then we're going to move on to more discussion about the growth monitoring, building permits, and then report status update and schedule adjustments. Uh, so we'll go through that and Heather and Elena will be walking us through that. So if there is any questions or additions or anything, um, please raise your hand and let us know. Otherwise, we'll just proceed with the agenda as uh, prepared. Um, well, I will go ahead and call for approval of the um, the 916 21 Zoom meeting summary. Hopefully you've all had a chance to take a look at that. And if um, there are no questions or concerns or changes, I would welcome a motion. So move. Ed McMahon, um, is there a second? Rick Duncan, thank you, Rick. Okay. I'll go ahead and call for the vote. So all of those in favor of the um, Zoom meeting summary? Okay, any opposed? What about abstentions? Okay, we've got two abstentions. All right. May I just add, I, I did vote in favor of supporting it because I did listen to the um, the recording, even though I wasn't at the meeting, so. Okay, thanks, Bill. Mark, okay. I didn't see. I didn't see Mark's Who's hand. Whose hand? Mark. Oh, Mark. Mark, how did you vote? Oh, he's Mike. frozen. Yeah. Mark, are you frozen? Oh no, he's blinking. He's not frozen. He's very still. Mark, did you vote in favor or oppose, or do, do, were you abstaining from the vote on the minutes from last meeting? I, don't. I, think, I think he was, I think he was there. I'm wondering, Mark, can you hear us? Maybe that's something yeah. we should find out first. Maybe he's okay. We'll, we, let's circle back and we'll get okay. Mark's vote on the, on the, Thank you. the agenda. Um, okay, yeah, I think you're, you're right. I, I'd have to look and I can't remember. There was quite a few people gone last time, but um, so we did talk a little bit. So Michelle um, has, has moved on. She's has a, a wonderful opportunity that she's pursuing. So it's taking her out of the area. So um, the next order of business is we were hoping that someone would like to step up and um, volunteer to be the vice chair of the ETAC. Um, and so could you guys, Heather or Elena, can you remind me the term that, is it just for the next calendar year starting? I don't even remember when I started. That is a great question. Um, I think we we were a little bit off. And so I think what we decided to do was um, cycle up with um, 
the fact that you do board, board and recruitment by um, at the end of the fiscal year. And so that would be, I think it's in May and June is when that recruitment happens. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, so then we would elect a chair and vice chair after that. Um, okay. Yep, and so this this um, period would have been a little bit longer for Michelle and is a little bit longer for you, but um, but now it'll be a little bit shorter for whoever's vice chair. Okay. So it's basically filling filling the 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 term uh, that Michelle had already started. So um, I would love to have some have a volunteer. It's pretty painless, and I'm generally here, so. Um, I nominate Kevin. Okay. John nom nominates Kevin Shanley. We have a second for Kevin. Oh, wow. We got a couple, we got multiple seconds. Any discussion? Kevin, would you like to say anything about the, the confidence that your peers have instilled in you here? Well, thank you. Um, uh, so I, I will humbly accept, I guess. Okay. Well, then with that, I will call for the vote. Uh, all those in favor of electing uh, Kevin Shanley as our vice chair, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Now, Mark is still having some technical difficulties, so I wouldn't take that personally, we'll, we'll circle back and get his vote on that one as well. But I think you got it, Kevin. So um, the only thing I will say is I have to leave a few minutes early today. Um, so you will have a, an opportunity to polish up your, your gavel skills, whatever you wanna call them. So, uh, okay. but we'll be, we'll be close to the end. And, and in fact, you know, who knows, we may be wrapping up. So Heather, you have your hand raised. What, you're, you're muted. You're, Heather, you're muted. It's telling me I'm muted also. Every, everything's telling me I'm muted. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, normally we would be, I think, talking about um, how to deal with replacement of Michelle. Um, what has been amazing is that um, Michelle's actually the first one to lead the ETAC. Everyone else has just kind of moved around and switched hats that they've been um, wearing. And so we actually have a pretty full committee right now anyway, um, especially with adding um, Dennis for the Sustainability Commission. So. Um, I am proposing that right now we hold off um, on recruitment and then um, circle back um, in a couple months and see how it's going um, because recruitment will be here kind of before we know it. Um, and there could be something else that comes up. So I just, I um, feel like we're in a spot right now where we don't really need to do um, recruitment for another um, position. So I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that and that um, that you knew what direction we were going, but that it hadn't slipped our radar, um, that we would like to um, make sure that we have all of our bases covered as far as the um, areas of expertise that Michelle brought. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's that's a good point. All right, any other questions or concerns? Well, I think that we are then ready to go into agenda item number three, growth monitoring building permits. And this is a continuation from last meeting. I I'm, I'm hope everybody had a chance to, to review that um, so that we can kind of keep, keep moving on. So Heather or Elena, I don't know which one of you guys wants to kick it off, but I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Looks like Mark's reconnecting. Um, excellent. And now you're hearing my dog shake. Sorry about that if you did. 
Um, okay, so I am going to share my screen. Oops, this is what I want to do. Share this slide. Okay. You guys seen um, the presentation? Yeah. Yes, I think we see it the way you intend. There's no notes or anything, so it's good. Except for you're muted, Heather. This devil monitor thing is tricky business. Um, okay, so first off, I just want to apologize that um, we sent you some late breaking information today. Elena sent it out to all of you. Um, we are desperately hoping to get you the growth monitoring report for your November 4th meeting. Um, and you know, the longer it takes for us to um, get the building permit data to you, then it delays that because we need that to be able to tie things together. Um, and so I did, we did go ahead and send you housing density data. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to get to it. I hope that we will. Um, and I'm fully prepared to just take your questions. Um, we've done a lot of quality control analysis on the density data. Um, I haven't had a ton of time to analyze it. Um, so I can give you kind of my quick hits on it, and then we can talk about it if there's time. So I just wanted to um, full disclosure on that because we'd certainly prefer to send you things um, ahead of time. So, um, so initially we're going to talk about. Um, what is the impact to the buildable lands inventory from the um, housing building permits that we've been talking about? And um, then we'll talk about the results, um, which we sent you the initial charts on and um, see if you have any questions. And of course, questions as we get done with each slide is also fine. Um, just raise your hand. Um, and then, like I said, if there's time, we'll go, um, we'll go through the housing density data that we sent out, um, questions, suggestions, and then um, do the um, update on the schedule. Uh, if there isn't, if we're running out of time um, and can't get to housing density, we'll move that um, schedule update to be, I'd like to leave, you know, basically five minutes at the end. So. Um, Kevin, if you're, I think you'll have the gavel at that point. So if it's 520, we should be wrapping up and moving into the schedule. So, um, all right. So there's a lot of text on this slide and I apologize. Um, so a lot of times we kind of short, uh, short change descriptions and talk about things in in abbreviations. So a lot of times we, um, at least staff talks about things like the, the BLI impact. And the reason that is, is because in the collection system that we set up, um, land track, where we are collecting how many acres of land is developed from the building permits that we're reviewing, we have a field <laughs> in there that's called the, um, the BLI impact. And really what that comes from is um, this spotlight that happens with the collection system where um, the lot might have been five acres at the time we ran the BLI, but by the time the building permit comes in, the lot has subdivided. And so now we're just doing a spotlight. We will just want to capture the acres for that lot that's now subdivided and is, you know, maybe an eighth of an acre. So that's our BLI impact acres that we're starting with. 
Um, and so really, I just wanted to make sure because sometimes I, we slip into that terminology. So um, I just want to make sure that's clear. So that's the acres of land. We're quantifying the acres of land that's developed um, from issued building permits. And right now we're focusing on new housing and we'll do the same thing for employment building permits. Um, when we're talking about what are all of the acres that are included in new housing development? Um, it's not just the buildings associated with the dwellings or that has the dwellings in it. It's also um, new parking areas, new accessory buildings like community buildings, um, uh, uh, garages, storage, bike shelters, um, open space and landscaping, anything that's generally part of the development that's happening um, for the new housing. Um, so then we, when we looked at the building permits and we categorized how much land was being impacted or the BLI impact, how much area was being developed, um, the collection system allows us to categorize that impact according to the type of buildable land that it's happening on. So is it happening on what the buildable lands inventory identified as vacant, partially vacant, developed, committed as committed for public use, or protected. And just as a reminder, protected is kind of a wide array of things. It could be natural resources. It could be protected because it's a historic property. Um, it could be quote unquote considered protected because it's got high slopes. Um, so, you know, there's quite a breadth there. Um, the other thing we're able to categorize the development and the acres of development by is um, the assumed comprehensive plan designation of the property. So we talked a little bit about that last time, how many dwellings, how many new dwellings are happening on different plan designations and um, how does that match or not match with what we forecasted for at this point in time in the monitoring period. Um, so that's mostly what these charts are gonna be looking at. and. Uh, as we get into the charts, totally slow me down if needed. Um, I'm just gonna get through this part really quick, Ed, if that's all right. Um, I just wanna get through this slide and then we'll, and then um, I'd like to do questions. Um, but it's easy because we're slicing and dicing this information multiple different ways. If I gloss over something or you need me to go back and compare different charts, um, because we do, they, they do go in between plan designation, BLI category, and um, dwellings versus acres. So there's a lot of information here. Um, and then I just wanted to do a reminder about how, when we did the building permit review, we captured um, how many acres were being developed from those building permits. So um, just as a reminder, um, there's more detail about this in that um, really lengthy um, and technical permit backfill review process memo. And that's in the ETAC folder on the website from um, August 19th. Um, but just as a reminder, if the development was happening on a BLI developed lot that was small, so less than half an acre, we did not review those for how many acres were being impacted. We assumed that that whole lot was being developed. Um, that's less than an issue for dwellings, and I'm going to show you some examples um, than it is for employment. Um, because employment, we're not looking at dwellings over a whole site, we're actually just looking at the building square footage that is added. And a lot of times for employment, it's just an addition. And so assuming that the whole lot developed is, um, is not accurate, um, is less accurate, but with dwellings, it's not as big of a concern. It's also a really small amount. So for dwellings, it was only 44 acres um, that were small developed lots that new dwellings happened on. 
um, if it was a change of use. So it was just going from like an office and being converted to dwellings and there was no new parking area. It was all internal. Um, we count the new dwellings and there's no impact to the buildable lands inventory because it's all internal. So those are awesome because we got, we gained capacity without using up more land. Um, if the lot was, or development site was um, more than one plan designation or more than one buildable lands inventory category. So it was LDR, low density residential and medium density or and or it was vacant and developed. We tried to distribute the, the dwellings and the impact um, to the BLI according to those different um, designations and categories if we could. Sometimes we weren't really able to, and we kind of had to use uh, the 80-20 rule that you remember me talking about. Um, mixed use buildings, a lot of times those are vertical mixed use. So um, I'll, we'll talk about an example there. Most of the time we were attributing the impact to the buildable lands inventory. So how many acres were developed, we were saying that that was all from the use that was the majority of the building. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to um, touch on a little bit of the quality control checking that we've been doing. Um, <clears throat> this has been a bit of an additional challenge that I think we weren't anticipating. We thought that, okay, we've got the data in the new collection system and we should just be able to report it. <laughs> um, and it turns out it's not quite that simple. Um, yes, we can pull that data in, um, but split plan designation is a really good example where over the development site, um, you might have one lot, and I'm going to talk about this, but um, you might have one lot and you don't want to double count the dwellings that are happening on the whole lot just because it's two different plan designations. So, um, so there was that. Um, there's also been some challenges with um, being able to capture, to really um, capture all of the development that's actually happening as a result of new housing. Um, and so I'm going to talk about those two examples specifically, the double counting and the, um, the issue we had with being able to capture all of the development that's happening. Okay, so I'm going to stop there um, and see if there's questions. Ed, why don't you go ahead, because I know you had one. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back up to uh, what's included in acres developed and ask about streets, sidewalks, stormwater facilities, and right-of-ways. Yeah, so at the time of building permit, um, you're already looking at the net acres. So the right-of-way has already been um, dedicated at the time, by the time we get to the building permit. So we're just looking at the tax lot that's being developed. And so, um, so we do a separate calculation to figure out how much land um, is used for right of way. Um, this is about, and you named another good one, utilities, anything that's happening on the private portion of the property. So stormwater, definitely stormwater swales. Um, yeah, anything that's associated with the tax lot itself that is developing. Okay, I recall during the first round, I think 20% of the development was for streets and things like that. And has that percentage increased at all or where, where does that stand? Yes, that's a great question. Um, we don't have that data ready yet, but the way we okay. looked at that was actually doing an analysis of plats so that we could look at the parent lot, the, um, the total lot at the, before it subdivided and then calculated how much of that lot was ended up being dedicated to right of way. So Elaine is actually doing that analysis right now. We um, updated our, our um, 
our land use applications um, system to try to um, put that information in as land use applications are being reviewed. Um, so we will have the data. We'll also have some great caveats to walk through with you, <laughs> just like I'm doing right now, because um, I have just found out that nothing is straightforward in this work. And so, um, but yeah, that's a really great point, Ed. We just will have to come back to you with that information. Thank you. Okay, any other questions at this point? I don't see any hands, so I guess, uh, Heather, we can go ahead and move on. Okay, so um, this example is about when it, and it actually ended up being both, um, where we have a split designation um, and or, and in this case, we also have a split BLI category. And so, like I mentioned, we tried to, um, when we're categorizing where the development is happening, we tried to attribute the dwellings to the actual plan designation um, and or BLI category that it is happening on or the majority of it is happening on, um, but also capture, make sure that we capture the impact um, to both areas. So here's our lot. Can you guys see my cursor moving? Okay, so here's our lot. Um, this is at the time of building permit. And so what you're seeing is that part of the lot is um, <clears throat> was identified as developed. So this is that spotlight that's happening. So, so actually maybe I'm gonna back up and go over here. So before the lot was subdivided into this lot, um, there was this tax lot, tax lot 4,900, which kind of goes under here. It's a really interestingly shaped lot. And what I've got on here is the aerial photo from 2013. So just after we ran the buildable lands inventory, but this lot was identified as developed. Um, it what the other lot that was part of the same subdivision is right here, which is outlined. Again, the window kind of covers it a little bit. Um, but this is vacant MDR. So MDR undeveloped is this portion and um, MDR developed is this funky looking larger lot. <clears throat> and so, so, those are that's legitimate. Um, tax lot 4900 was vacant at the time we did the inventory, and tax lot 4800 was considered developed at the time we did the inventory. So, when the building permit comes in, now we've got the BLI impact acres is doing a spotlight and it's saying, What is the extent of the lot that I'm looking at at the time of the building permit? it is um, much smaller than what we were looking at before and, and fun. Um, part of it was is vacant and part of it is developed. And so in this case, what we did is, um, and I think, is, oh, ah, ah. I can't, I, you guys are probably seeing this and I'm sorry. Um, so what we did was we attributed to the developed lot. We said that there was, um, I'm sorry, the undeveloped portion of the lot, which is the smaller portion. We said that there was for this building permit, for this dwelling, there what this portion is now impacted. So 0 0.04 acres of vacant MDR was, developed from this permit. And then, um, but we didn't attribute the dwelling to it because most of the lot and even the address point, that's what that is, is, um, is the developed portion of the lot. So we said um, 0.1 acres of developed land, MDR land is impacted by this building permit. And we attributed the dwelling to this. 
So that's a lot to say that um, we really try to geographically allocate things appropriately, but also capture all of the impact so that when we total up the impact to vacant MDR, um, that would be included in it. All right, I've got John has a question. John, you wanna go ahead? Thank you. A um, couple of questions. One, uh, the plan designation, is that the metro plan designation or is that a, an overlay a city plan designation? As far yeah, as no, as it's the metro plan designation. It's not the official version. This is the version we used for the BLI. Um, so I always have to put that caveat there because we had to make the metro plan version of the BL, of the um, plan designations tax lot specific and the metro plan version of the plan designations is not tax lot specific in all scenarios and so this is what we call the assumed comprehensive plan designation okay yeah that was that was one of my questions because that looks pretty specific for the for the metro plan map um, yeah so i was just curious on that and then the other thing is when you split these out i understand how you're uh, doing it to the BLI impact, how are you splitting it out as it uh, uh, reflects to density? Are you going to the full 1.4 acres on the density or are you only counting the 0.1 acre on the density? Yeah, no, the density would be, density is done, and we'll talk more about density if we have time, um, which I hope we do, um, but density is calculated for the whole site that is in that zone. And so um, since this is both MDR vacant and MDR um, developed, I think it was probably R2. Um, and so the density was done for the whole, the whole lot um, as R2. And then, um, yeah. Okay. But remember that um, when we do talk about density, because we might come back to this example. Uh, um, welcome, Alexis. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was late. I was actually on the phone for the first part of it. Lost cell phone reception during it, but I'm back home. No problem. Glad to have you. If you have any questions, it would be a good time, but I think we're... We're just kind of moving right along. So um, no questions at this time, according to the hands. Okay, um, I'm gonna move into the next example. So um, this is that, um, as I mentioned, there are, there is a group of permits that while in the collection system, um, we attributed the BLI impact by use very specifically um, by use. Um, when the collection system got these permits, um, sorry, not the collection system, when the reporting system got the data from these development sites that have a mixture of uses, it, it kind of didn't know what to do. Um, so, you know, I call this kind of our group of miscellaneous development sites that appear to have a mixture of uses going on on the site, but um, because of that, when we're tallying the total impacts from the different types of permits, the system couldn't automatically attribute the impacts to being from housing permits or to being from commercial permits. So what we had to do is we had to manually review what looks like in, in the reporting system as commercial uses to figure out if there are actually housing permit impacts um, or if they're actually employment related impacts. So I'm gonna got three examples here. Um, the first one is, this is an apartment complex um, over by Crescent Village. Um, they have a recreation building and they have a garage. And so those came in on separate building permits. So we actually had to give them separate uses in the system. Um, and so the uses we gave them were motor vehicle for the garage and entertainment and recreation for the community building. 
And then we attributed, attributed the BLI impacts for those areas um, according to those uses. So most of the BLI impact on this lot would go to the dwellings, but there was a little bit that was going to um, motor vehicle and a little bit that was going to this entertainment and recreation. And so um, the system doesn't know that from a high level, is this all housing development related? And these are just accessory to it. And so I should count these as impacts related to new dwellings, or is this actually a mixed use site? And I need to account, I need to put that, those commercial uses over in with our employment building permits, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, so in this case, it's pretty clear. Um, we attributed the whole site to new housing. You know, this is a BLI impact to, um, as a result of new housing. Uh, this one is more of our traditional mixed use building. It has retail on the ground floor with apartments above. Um, looks the same in the collection system where it's got two uses. It's got a residential use that's happening with a non-residential use. And so the system doesn't know where to put that non-residential use. Um, so clearly this one is retail that is um, accessory to the residential, but in a different way. It's not for the residential. It's not part of the um, integral to the housing development it doesn't have to be there. Um, so we would want to make sure that if there was any building square footage or any BLI impact from the retail that that gets attributed to employment building permits. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, when we have vertical mixed use, if the building is predominantly one use, which is the case here is predominantly like overwhelmingly um, apartments, then we actually attributed the buildable lands inventory impact all to the housing use. So we capture the number of dwellings and then we say the whole impact from the site, all the parking, everything is going to housing permits. And then when we get to employment building permits, we'll capture the square, the um, building square footage of the retail and put that in our employment permits, but there won't be any BLI impact. We did have some cases where the building was split, like there was retail and then there was apartments, like exactly floor for floor. And so we just did 50-50 on the BLI impact on that. Um, so you'll remember some of this discussion because Elena and Zoli detailed this. And so I'm just kind of reminding you of this because now we're actually going to see the results of doing that work. Um, and then this one is just kind of fun. <laughs> um, so we have a couple instances or more, like surprisingly more than a couple where um, a storage facility or some sort of industrial type use warehousing is looking at, um, looks to have um, like an, a, an apartment for a security, um, a security guard. And in this case, the apartment or sorry, the, the one family dwelling was with the office. And so it was such a small amount that, uh, is kind of the opposite of the mixed use building up here where we attributed the BLI impact all to the employment use, which was um, the storage facility. We still captured that a dwelling was happening. So we got that, but there was zero buildable lands inventory impact for that dwelling. It was pretty small. That's our kind of our 80-20. Okay. Any questions this far? Okay, keep going. All right, so our first one here that we're looking at, um, we are gonna talk about acres, um, but this one is the, um, the metric here is actually dwellings. So it's looking at how many dwellings that we have seen. So we've seen 8,010 uh, 8, net new dwellings overall. 
Um, and how many of those have been on vacant land, partially vacant, developed, et cetera. And then within those BLI categories, um, what plan designations have they been on? Um, just like our charts from last time, uh, starting on the left, you've got the um, 2012, and it's really just kind of the end of 2012, to July of 2021. Um, that is the number of dwellings total that we've seen during that time period or net new dwellings. And then we have the 2013 to um, 2032 trend. So as a reminder, that is basically taking what we've seen, the actuals that we've seen and trending them out to 2032. So if the trends that we've seen during the monitoring period continue all the way to the end of our 20 year planning period, what would that look like? Um, and then the third bar in all of these is um, the adopted forecast. And so that's what you can kind of do is say, okay, well, we're 8.5 years into monitoring period, we've seen this. If this continues, you can see these proportions are very similar. So if this continues to 20 years, this is what it looks like, and this is what we actually forecasted for 20 years. Um, so um, what we've seen for 2012 to 2021, where we're at right now, is 50% um, of dwellings have been on vacant and par partially vacant, and 41% have been on developed. The, that's a little bit different than the forecast. The forecast um, assumed that 77% would be on vacant and partially vacant, and um, only a quarter of new dwellings would be undeveloped. Um, developed land has had uh, the most new dwellings, which is kind of surprising. Hmm. Um, that is higher um, than forecasted for the number of dwellings on developed land in all plan designations. So you can see that here where um, we did assume that there would be a lot of um, development on, I feel like I'm saying developed a lot. There would be a lot of new housing on developed commercial land. Um, but the percentages that we're at are actually higher than um, what we would have seen for the 20 year period. The, where we're at right now is already higher in percentage than what we forecasted for the 20 year period. Um, and we've talked about this before, we have a higher number than forecasted on all, com all commercial, so commercial by all BLI, um, land categories and lower than forecasted for this point in time on um, vacant and partially vacant, particularly for low density residential. I've got Bill with a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, Heather, can, can you, um, I guess, you know, I'm just curious about your observations about why these numbers are reflecting or trending the way they are. I would think maybe it's just because, hey, already developed properties are easier to redevelop in some sense if they're if they're already developed, but perhaps with a lower value kind of development. It's a it's a vacant lot. It's a parking lot. It's uh, commercial allows it, and otherwise maybe more of these vacant, especially as you see vacant and partially vacant residentially designated properties that we've already developed the easy to develop stuff and now it has some kind of slope it has some kind of uh you know challenge to it and so it's just really um development is following the the easiest path is that sort of some of the um you know maybe what you tease out from these these kind of findings yeah, that's really an interesting way to put it because when we were doing the UGB analysis, redevelopment was thought to be the harder of, um, of all of the lots to redevelop or to um, do new development on because we did some market analysis and it generally found that it didn't pencil out to redevelop 
developed land in Eugene um, without financial incentives. Um, and so there were a couple caveats to that. One, again, financial incentives like MUPTI or low income um, property, low income housing property tax exemptions, um, SDCs, um, which, you know, we have some transportation SDCs that are, that um, SDC credits that are um, reducing SDC costs downtown and near corridors, which are mostly developed areas. Um, so, so the incentives have an impact. Um, housing around the university um, and downtown, there's not a lot of vacant land in either of those places. And that's where we have seen a lot of development happening. And so, um, you know, just as a reminder, 72% of the new housing that we've seen has been multifamily housing. And so, um, so, you know, I think that, I think you've got some specific market conditions that are happening that are, um, that just haven't cooled down yet. I wonder too, if just, if I could add on one thing, just a suggestion, it would probably be helpful maybe to the policymakers if you if you could add any kind of spatial or, or um, you know mapped information that would illustrate some of this about hey these are the areas that are developing it's not so much out um, as you talked about last uh, last meeting um, you know in the Crow Road area where uh, utilities need to be extended that's where maybe the forecasted area shows this developable potentially developable vacant residential land but it's not happening there because of probably the expense of you know, pushing utilities out to develop that area. And that's why I say that, you know, maybe if you showed spatially or graphically that it's happening kind of around campus, just because there's some center of gravity, there's utilities that are already available, people are applying for these kind of credits and that kind of thing. So maybe having not only just a, a bar chart, uh, but maybe a, a, a geographic map might be handy. Yeah, um, and thank you for bringing up the Crow Road because that's the other piece of the coin. And we will, so as you guys know, Thea has been working on rerunning the buildable lands inventory to get a monitoring snapshot of where we're at. So we have, we'll have information that we're looking at right now about how many acres we've developed, but she's also rerunning the, um, the model for us. And um, one of the things she is doing is she's gonna document how much of the land supply is annexed versus not annexed. And it's not a perfect indicator um, as far as whether or not utilities are to it or not. Um, just because it's not annexed doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have utilities, but it's a pretty good indicator. And so um, I think that is the other side of the coin, why you know part of the reason we haven't seen some development on um, low density residential specifically. Speak further, um, John, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I, I was just gonna kind of dovetail on that. Um, anecdotally, I think that one, we've seen more multifamily. You're gonna see multifamily more along corridors and and improved infrastructure. So that would, that would tend to, lead towards developed land. The other thing that is out there is we've seen it, I, you know, I've seen it at, at Planning Commission, larger uh, PUDs and things like that have had a lot, have had a hard time getting permitted because of appeals and those types of things. So there's been a lot of, you know, vacant land that is, some, I think some developers are just saying, you know what, it's not worth it to me to, to go through the time and expense to develop this when I can just, you know, redevelop something somewhere else. And then the third thing is, I think going forward, I think that this trend will continue, especially with the implementation, implementation of House Bill 2001. I think we're going to see the same type of thing on a smaller scale instead of Instead of turning Cafe Yum into 200 units, we're going to see turning, you know, a, a lower value house into a 
quadplex or something like that. So I, I see this as a trend going forward. Um, so when we when they decide whether or not it's time to look at a a new UGB update that we kind of keep these things in mind. And that's where these numbers are going to be very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, Heather, I want to jump in with a quick comment. Uh, nobody else is is in the queue at the moment. But I do also, I, I agree with Phil. I think it would really be helpful to kind of have a better sense of where uh, the redevelopment has been happening. I know, you know, uh, one of the things that we talk about, you know, at, at LTD is, is the fact that there has been considerable development that's been spurred by the West Eugene uh, MX route. And that is existing infrastructure that's being redeveloped because it's now on bus rapid transit route. And so that those types of things that, you know, there's a correlation there. And as we continue to plan for more things like that, you know, looking at other um, corridors and whatnot and looking at where our where other amenities exist, I think that, you know, um, I I would see that that would make more sense. If I was a developer and I had an opportunity and it might cost me a little bit more, but I could be right on a major, um, you know, bus route versus putting something at the end of Delta Highway, which I mean, maybe didn't cost as much because it was bare land, but it maybe the return of investment is a completely different. And so, I think it would actually be helpful to look and see where um, the redevelopment is happening, uh, you know, aside from the university area, because I think there's some other trends, you know, macro trends that might tie to, to why that's happening. Yeah, and that's great feedback, you guys. One of, um, one of the couple goals that we have yet to really focus on with growth monitoring, because this part has taken us a while, um, is that we wanna do a community dashboard. Um, and the dashboard that I refer to, I think I've showed you guys, um, is out of Seattle. Of course, city of Seattle, right? I have to go big, um, but they, have an interactive map that shows where their building permits are and their scale, the dots on the map are scaled to the amount of dwellings. Um, and you can zoom in or zoom out. So I love that. Um, and then there's a bunch of other information. I think we should be able to do something along those scales. It won't, it won't be um, interactive, obviously, at this point, but we should be able to do some sort of mapping. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is we do want to be able to run, have some standard charts or tables that give us data around corridor development and also by neighborhood in general. Um, so we haven't spoke to those out yet, but that's definitely the next phase of the program. Thanks, Heather. Kevin, go ahead. So Heather, I'm guessing that a little later in this evening's presentation, you'll correlate um, the actual acreage of these different categories. Um, these are number of units, but the, the impact on buildable lands is gonna be measured in acres. So does that come a little bit later? It is. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so these next charts, that's a, Excellent segue. Um, these next charts are um, all focused on acres. Um, and so um, this first one, we're going to revise the title a little bit because it's easy to get lost, but this is the annual average of acres developed by BLI category and plan designation. So this is not the total that is developed in low density residential. This is the annual average that's happened so far compared to what we forecasted. So, um, you know, this matches what we talked about a little bit before with the number of dwellings um, developing at a slower pace on low density residential. So it, um, you know, kind of makes sense that the number of acres that have developed, unless all of a sudden LDR was super dense, um, that the number of acres that have developed on average have um, also been at a slower pace. Um, 
And then like we talked about um, on, av on annual average, high density residential and commercial acres developed have been a little bit higher um, than we forecasted to need on average. Um, and then medium density residential has been lower than we forecasted. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, there may be some of the same annexation or um, services issues um, with LDR that there are with MDR. <clears throat> um, let's see, additionally in this chart, there is a zero, zero average acres developed um, on government and education. There was a zero when I wrote these notes. Um, it looks like the zero disappeared, but um, I have this in here. Um, we'll I'll take it out and I'll take out parks and open space when we do the actual report because it's a bit of noise. Um, but I do want to just acknowledge that there has been some development. Um, it was over 300 units on government and education. Um, it's really government and education combined with university research. And so there was one um, 230 unit um, project on Franklin, and then there was one 50 plus unit um, that was done by Homes for Good, and both of those were on government and education. So the reason that there's no um, average here is because they it was only two projects as a very small piece of land. So there's um, the average is very tiny. Um, we also didn't forecast that any housing was going to happen on government and education land um, other than dorms. Um, so this is actually going to be helpful information when we move into the next UGB analysis to track that and see if we actually do continue to see more housing, market housing on, um, on public land, not campus, but other publicly owned land. I'm going to go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay. So this is acres developed. So total acres developed, whereas the last one was the annual average. This is total acres developed with new housing. Um, that has been overwhelmingly vacant. And partially vacant land for acres developed. So the total acres developed has also been overwhelmingly in residential designations. So that's a little bit different than when we talked about the number of dwellings. Um, so the total acres developed in residential designations has been 93% or 508 acres compared to in commercial. Um, it's been 6% six, 6 of the acres developed were in commercial or 33 acres. And so what's, what's interesting about that is like I said, only 67% of new dwellings have happened on residential plan designations compared to 29% happening on commercial. So to put that in a different way, it took 508 residential acres to develop 5,400 dwellings. And it took six commercial acres to develop 2,300 dwellings. And as we've been talking about, we've seen such a large amount of large apartment complexes that that's that's a big reason why um, is that those are their large apartment complexes so they can only happen on HDR and commercial um, and that's where they're happening they're really big a lot of them are really big um, and because they're really big they're not using up as much land <clears throat> this also I think when we get to the density conversation is just something that um, you know we know about how different housing types use land differently. So um, you know, 
obviously a 12 story building is going to have more. I just have the Franklin apartments <laughs> um, in my mind because we were just talking about it. But a 12 story building is going to have a lot of dwellings, but use less land than, for instance, like a duplex. Um, so and then when you think about where you see those different housing types, you see taller and more dense housing in commercial and HDR than you do in um, you know, low density and median density residential where they tend to use more land um, because that's traditionally the housing types that we've seen more of in those lands. <clears throat> So this, I think, you know, I think that's one of the things I'm not sure what to do with it, but it, I don't, I don't think that there is anything to do with it. I think um, it's just going to, it's going to be interesting to see if land does get served that isn't served right now, low density residential and medium density residential, if that's what's going on, um, how that shifts. Um, if the student-oriented housing market slows down, is that going to shift um, the amount, uh, you know, the, the number of units that we're seeing in multifamily, the, it, particularly the big multifamily, um, and then the acres that are developing in the different plan designations and the different BLI categories? Um, John, go ahead. Oh, do you not have a comment? Yeah. Um, so, Heather, do you think that the, I mean, obviously these large 12 story on commercial and high density, they have different requirements as far as the amount of land that they need. Uh, you know, a medium density apartment complex is, has to have so much open space and those types of things. Um, so are, are we capturing that some, somehow when we're, when we're gonna present this to, to city council, we're gonna say, you know, yeah, you can build a 12 story on where Louis Village was, right? So, I mean, if, if you used to drive by where Louis Village was, nobody ever imagined that you could put 250 units where that was, but yet that's what we've got. Um, but yet, if you wanted to put 250 units in a medium density residential, you're going to have to have setbacks. You're going to have to have open spaces. You're going to have to have a lot more land for the same amount of units. Is there a way to capture that in our report so that we know that if we're looking at, you know, what's our buildable land inventory, and if 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 you're putting 250 units on medium density, it takes this much land. If you put 250 units on high density, it takes this much land. And, and I don't know, it's just something that we, I don't know if we need to capture that or not. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's so much in the report. Um, and I think that's a really good, uh, you know, I, everything you guys, just have these great ideas about how to um, give some context around the data. Um, you know, we, I mean, I guess I would say from a data standpoint, you see that in the densities, right? Like I was talking about the housing types, um, you know, some of that is derived by the development standards that are around it. So a medium density residential, the maximum building height is much lower than it is in high density residential. So that has an impact, um, you know, things like that. Um, you get an exemption from, or can provide less open space if you have more density and you're more likely to do that in HDR. So we're gonna see that more in HDR. Commercial doesn't have the same requirements. And so you might see more density in commercial because of that. So you're absolutely right. The standards do play an impact. Um, I'm gonna make a note of that to think about how we can weave that into, I don't know if it's the executive summary or, um, or some part of the report because, um, 
the data itself is not going to say because of this setback, these are the densities we're seeing, or because of this height limitation, you know, it's not going to say that. It's just going to tell you um, the densities that we're seeing on the different plan designations. But yeah, we can say, and as a reminder, um, you know, you can't build the same thing on each plan designation. Um, there's different standards, and so some of those guide um, the densities that you're seeing. It's not just because people are deciding to do lower density on MDR than they are on commercial. Yeah. Yeah, John, that's a really good point. I, I just like in kind of thinking out loud, it's, you know, the policy decisions and the how we are zoning and how we are even changing zoning. Like when I think about the, the River Road neighborhood plan, for example, and some of the the rezoning opportunities that they're looking at that will actually drive development because that's the point. And so those, you know, I, I, it's, I'm trying to figure out how, like, how do you capture that to where these policy decisions that change the densities and change the zoning and how, how we're purposing the, this, the, this specific area or whatever you want to call it in order to create more density, that's, exactly it's working the way it's supposed to i mean you do that to then drive the development there because you don't want to have large multi-family uh or multi-unit um development that's that doesn't have access to uh, other amenities that that are needed um and that are you know so anyway i just i feel like there's it makes sense that we would that we're that that's that, that's the outcome that happens when you have um, you know density redevelopment is is the is the outcome um, anyway. And if I can just respond to that, I know we have another yeah. hand up, but just to um, that's what I, I mean. That's an efficiency measure, right? You know, if you change the code to allow more housing types or reduce development standards or whatever, you know, those are the things that are called efficiency measures for a reason because they do um, provide the opportunity for the land to be used more efficiently. And the R2 um, zone was changed to increase the minimum density that's required in R2. So we should be seeing higher densities eventually, not higher, but higher than um, we have been seeing in R2 eventually, but that code change didn't go into effect in 2000, until 2017. So we're still seeing development approved under the old standards, but that's a really good um, comparison, I think, about what um, that kind of change can have an impact on. Kevin, I see your hand, go ahead. So there's an important corollary to this discussion, and that's cost per unit to provide municipal services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an old truism that uh, single family houses don't support themselves from a tax to services standpoint, and that generally it's employment. But at a certain point in the density curve, residential properties can actually uh, pay for themselves. And I don't know if that's in the purview of this exercise and the report you're doing. Um, it may be some other city department that's got to essentially um, shine a light on those kinds of observations for our elected officials, but um, it might, uh, might fall into your report somewhere. Just thinking about you know, the distinction between providing uh, infrastructure for Crow Road versus improving the infrastructure along River Road where you've got the potential for density. Yeah, there was some analysis that was done um, with the firm uh, Urban 3 um, that I believe we brought to the technical resource group, the earlier incarnation of this group, um, that was around those, that very type of analysis. Um, and so 
I think that it is relevant for policy conversation, um, and that and the some of that analysis has already been done, but probably not necessarily part of the growth monitoring report itself. Um, but there's definitely a nexus there. Like you need all of the information to um, be able to make those policy decisions. All right, I don't have any other hands up. Okay, move to the next slide. So one of the things that I wanted to dig into a little bit further because it, um, it, I, it was interesting and curious was just how much of the developed land was um, developing with new housing. And oops, it's gonna go back here. So um, it's about 130 acres here of developed land was developed with new housing. Um, the majority of that development, I kind of feel a little bit like a broken record, was multifamily um, was happening on developed land. So that was that redevelopment. Um, about 416 were single family detached, but I still was like surprised that it was that many. And so I dug into that a little bit further to just see what was going on. Um, so there are some examples that make a lot of sense. So in this case, this is a single family dwelling. They added an ADU. That's why there's two address points here. Um, and so the lot was already developed at the time of the buildable lands inventory. After the buildable lands inventory, they added an ADU. And so it makes sense that that dwelling would be attributed to developed land. Um, manufactured home parks are another one. Those come up as developed in the BLI. And so um, new housing on a lot in the manufactured home park that was vacant at the time we ran the BLI um, is gonna come up as um, housing happened, happening on developed land. If it was a replacement of a, of a manufactured home that was there at the time we ran the BLI, then we did not count that as a new dwelling. So I just wanna make that clear. It was only if when we ran the BLI it was vacant. So those, those made a lot of sense. Um, this is another example. So this outline here um, is the buildable lands, the lot configuration at the time of the buildable lands inventory. It had a house on it and then it subdivided. Um, so, you know, there were a number of those. So every one, every one of these new, um, address points that are happening, even if the house demoed, which often happened when they, um, subdivided it, um, it, all of those new houses or the net number of new houses that were on there, um, would be attributed to developed land. So it's just kind of interesting because when you look at it, it's not developed, but it's because at the time of the BLI, the whole lot was considered developed. And you might look at that and go, well, why was this considered developed at the time of the BLI? Well, it's because it was less than an acre. And in um, low density residential, we started looking for partially vacant capacity for lots that are, were um, an acre or larger. And then um, there were some instances where I couldn't totally tell why it was developed at the time of the buildable lands inventory. Um, in this case, um, it the property is this one that now has a house or had a house permitted during the monitoring period. Um, the lot did have over a thousand dollars worth of improvement value on it at the time of the buildable lands inventory. And, and that was one of our um, indicators which we've talked about readdressing the next time we, um, that feels maybe too low with, with inflation. Um, but that's what we used back then. There also seems like maybe there's something in there, but um, you know, the, it could be an example of that there was something, it got demoed, they added something, it could be outdated data, I don't know. But these were three examples that, um, I wanted to make sure you know that we kind of looked into um, to make sure that um, you know the data was accurate um, to the best degree that we can. Okay. 
So now just looking at each individual plan designation. So low density residential has the largest, largest acreage of vacant and partially vacant land for housing. So when I say that, I'm saying that the forecast was for um, about 2,000 acres that would um, that there is vacant and partially vacant and developed land for um, for housing, and we've developed about 18 percent of that. So there's been um, this portion is showing you what's been developed. That's about 387 acres have developed with housing. Um, as we've talked about, this is lower, is a slower pace than we anticipated for LDR at this point in the monitoring period. Um, it could be because of, um, you know, the utility, the services, lack of services, um, annexation, um, the amount of land that is flat versus sloped. So that's information we'll be getting from Thea in the snapshot. Um, I can say that uh, I had her asked her to run a quick check on unannexed land, and there was about 780 acres um, as of August that in the new BLI of LDR that was um, unannexed vacant land. So um, that was quite a bit. So I'm going. Um, quick, quick, quick question on this, and this may be if uh, if some of the other people that were on technical resource group, like uh, Rick and Sue, do you think this is a kind of attributable to the what we used to call uh, phantom land? You know, we we referred to it as phantom buildable land, and do you think that that's what this is playing out to be? you know, land that we thought would develop that was vacant or partially vacant that is never going to develop because it's just not developable. I mean, we talked about it and we're like, we really need to see numbers if this is really phantom land that we're counting. And to me, this shows that that might be the case. Sue, go ahead. You're muted though. Um, from my perspective, at this point, what's happening is the things that are the easiest to do. Um, it's infill, it's odd little small pieces, and Rick might have different perspective than I do, but um, it's tiny little things. But the thing is, land is really expensive right now. It's so expensive. Um, building costs are expensive. Materials are expensive. Um, Supply lines are delayed. I mean, there are just a lot of factors that go into it. It's a complex market, in my opinion. Um, and what I'm seeing happening is just, where can people find the easiest opportunities to make something happen? Rick? Yeah, I, um, I agree with what Sue was saying. I think also, John, you're right that there was always discussions on the TRG about the, like the lands up in the South Hills and were they really developable? Um, and I think you're right that some of that is a phantom land um, that really can't ever be developed. I mean, we went through small subdivisions where there were three or four lots up there that have been available for decades that nobody's even touched. Um, I also think that I'm gonna gather that some of the land is also the Crow Road land, which is a significant amount of land that nobody can do anything with because the cost to serve is well beyond what private industry can handle. It's gotta be city services that come in and actually extend the major lines that need, to be, that need to be placed out there for the land to be readily available for anyone to develop. Interesting. Anyone else? Go ahead, Heather. Okay. Hey. 
So medium density residential um, is the next largest in the amount of supply. You can see our scale is changing quite a bit. The amount of supply that we had identified in um, our buildable lands inventory. Um, 76 acres have developed in total with housing development. Um, yeah, we have talked about the Crow Road area and the Crow Road area is interesting because it's actually a mix of medium density residential and low density residential. So, um, so I think the unannexed portions of that could be having um, an effect on both of those. And I'm not saying unannexed, sorry. The, the fact that that area is underserved um, is probably having some impact on the supply on both of these. Um, and, but then again, like Sue was saying, um, all of this has a big caveat around it because we're in such an interesting um, point in time right now. Um, the other thing, I think I mentioned this, but, um, or I know I mentioned this, is um, actually this doesn't have to do with acres, so I'm just going to go to the next slide. So I put these two together, um, high density residential and commercial. Um, you can, they have a similar scale, but again, you can see now we're, where we went from the low density residential, we were planning for about um, 2000 acres in the supply. And now we're down here quite a bit um, where we're looking at what high density has um, almost 60 acres and commercial has almost 90. So, um, so a lot smaller land supply that we're looking at. Um, for high density residential, about 42 acres in total have developed with housing. Um, and this is, seems really odd. I saw this and thought, something was going on. We must be double counting somewhere here. But what's happening is that when we do the UGB analysis, um, there is a recognition that not all of the housing, I'm sorry, not all of the land that's planned, that seems to be planned for housing actually develops with housing. So we have to account for the fact that some LDR, MDR, and HDR land is going to be used for um, group quarters. Um, some is going to be used for neighborhood commercial. Some is going to be used for streets and roads, like Ed was bringing up. Um, so we, so when we identify, when we include here um, how much vacant land we were saying is in the the land supply for housing, we, own, we said that there was only five acres. Five acres of our vacant HDR land would be available for housing because of these other, these other uses is what we kind of call them. Um, and in fact, 19 acres of HDR has been developed with new dwellings. <laughs> so that just didn't happen. Um, and I don't know where, you know, what's gonna happen with those, our group quarters gonna go somewhere else. Um, is neighborhood employment gonna go somewhere else? Not sure. Um, we haven't talked about the employment building permits yet. We'll get to that, but, um, but that's, that's kind of, that's what's going on here and why it looks so weird. For commercial, about 32 acres in total um, have developed with housing. Similarly, the forecast assumed zero um, new housing on commercial vacant land. Um, most of the housing we anticipated or projected that would happen on commercial land was going to be downtown and along Franklin, and most of that land um, was developed. And we assumed it would happen with incentives like MUPTI. Um, so what's interesting is that, in fact, um, 15.75 acres of commercial vacant land has actually developed with, um, with housing. And so one of those uh, I showed you earlier where it was um, multiple apartment buildings with the recreation building and the garages out by um, Crescent Village, that's actually commercial designation and completely developed with housing. 
um, of the 15.75 acres that have been developed of commercial that have been um, here, a vacant commercial that have been developed, um, about almost all of them, 12 of the acres are from two different apartment complexes. So that was one. And then there was another one over um, on the west side of town. Looks like, so that was all I was gonna say on that slide unless there's questions. Yeah, Phil's, Phil's got a question. Yeah, may, maybe you kind of touched upon this. Is the, in the commercial, when the capstone project was built, the old uh, Eugene Clinic site, you know, had the clinic buildings that were multi-story, but also a lot of uh, uh, parking lots. Was that, I mean, in a, I'm not sure if that's captured in these numbers, 2012 and on. Yes. If it is, then was that considered built upon this vacant portion or developed? Developed. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's not showing here, but I want to say one of the properties, it wasn't, it's a small portion, but it was actually identified in the BLI as protected. Um, and I'm not sure if it had a historic resource that was documented before they redeveloped it, but um, so there would be a little bit of development that happened on commercial protected. It's just not showing up here, but yeah, it was all developed and we did count it um, in here. Yeah. Okay, um, Heather, with that, I think this is a good pausing moment because I need to I need to leave and so Kevin is going to take over and man the queue I will watch the rest and make sure that I'm up to speed when I see you all again on the 14th is that our next meeting 14th um Pulling it up right here 21st, 21st. 21st. okay yeah <laughs> I was Sorry. like, no, too soon. I'm not ready. I didn't need to scare you all. Okay. Uh, have a good night, everybody, and uh, I will see you soon. I'll figure out how to get so, out of here. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Um, so if there's nobody in the queue, I'm just going to go to the last slide here um, <clears throat> because it's pretty. low amount of information, but um, just for full transparency, as we talked about earlier, there is some housing that has happened and uh, you see our scale here. Some housing has happened on vacant industrial, less than an acre, um, government and education, um, about one and a half acres for those almost 300 units. And then parks and open space, there has been a little bit of housing that's happened on what the BLI identified as parks and open space. Some of that may not actually be parks and open space designation. It's a symptom of stretching out the comprehensive plan map and trying to make it a lot specific in an automated way. Um, however, there are some properties, I think along Spring Boulevard and Diller Road area that um, are near the ridge line and identified as um, parks and open space, could be parks and open space, um, and were already platted for housing. So you see some housing happening there. Um, we talked about the storage facility example with the single family dwelling. So anyway, this is a little bit of noise, I think. Um, so I'm not planning, this will be footnoted in the report, but just wanted to make sure you all knew about it. Questions, suggestions, love to hear them. You guys have been, as usual, great discussion. Rick has his hand up. So I'm I'm somewhat surprised, Heather, that the housing in low and medium is is so low compared to our projections, given the high demand. Um, I'm wondering if some of it has to do with 
the market's anticipation of what pricing of housing they can achieve on the lands that they have developed versus not being able to afford to build housing on some of these lands um, because they just can't achieve the high price they're trying to get to. And it, it just seems to me that our, our forecasting is so far out of whack that we need to figure out what has caused that. Because, I mean, we had a lot of discussions at TRG about you know housing affordability and housing for all sectors and so on and so forth. And yet it doesn't appear that we're achieving the kind of housing that we had expected to come online. And it seems to me from a policy standpoint, it would be good to try to figure out what challenge are facing the builders out there that aren't willing to supply the housing that we had expected would be supplied to buyers, if, I, if that makes any sense. Yeah, a um, couple of things there. One is that, um, we're gonna have another opportunity. So right now with the growth monitoring report, we're trying to talk about the status of where things are compared to where we thought we would be. And so it's doing its job, right? Is we're, we've monitored it and we've seen that like, this is not how we thought, where we thought we would be on average um, at this point in the period. And so, when we go into our housing capacity analysis for the next UGB discussion, which we're gonna have to do really soon, um, that will be an opportunity to dig into this more. Um, I think I th that's the way I'm thinking about it is that the growth monitoring report doesn't have to answer all of our questions. It has to highlight or help identify where um, we are not either on track or where we thought we would be, um, that is a is a impetus for us to explore it further. Um, but I don't know that we have to do that in the report itself, because when we get to the housing capacity analysis, there's going to be a lot more market information than we're doing in the growth monitoring report. Right now, we're just checking our assumptions and we're seeing, wow, this looks different. Um, and then what was the other thing I was gonna say? I don't know, so I will stop talking. So Phil had a question and then after Phil, Sue has her hand up. Yeah, just a, <clears throat> an observation is maybe actually is beyond the discussion today and, and I'm thinking back to the to last um, meeting about efficiency measures and, and where, um, you know, we included in that was, uh, and, and there was some question about, you know, which about the uh, efficiency of the efficiency measures. And I think that's super important to, to tease out. I think Howard might have asked about that. Um, I would be willing to bet that MUPTI is the one that has probably moved the dial the most, that the raw number of units, the most efficient use of, of space, as you've kind of talked about, little acres, a lot of units, but it's probably occurring in this one particular sector of student housing that's not broadly available and not meeting this, this total demand or, or the, the need in the community. And when you see in the, it's the graphic that you had in the, in the materials about uh, the percent of need met and the total <clears throat> that you had there for a 10 year period in all categories of new dwellings, um, we're talking about 50 acres a year over a 10 year period. So, I mean, I, I think we are undershooting the need for sure. And what are those kind of things that, you know, we, we've tried a number of interventions um, with, you know, rezoning and ADUs and so forth. We've only got, what, I think 44 ADUs that have been developed, I believe was what you mentioned previously. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that we're doing, but the ones that are maybe moving the dial the most are the ones that are more, uh, you know, there may be more needed of, of an easier way to try to adjust and move to get housing unit production done. I guess just an observation. So uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that, sorry. So 
So Heather, if you don't have a response to that, Sue? I just have um, two comments. One is I'd be curious to know what Ed has to say in response to John's question, um, because Ed is so connected with the builders. So that's one question, the other one comment. The other comment is that this is where I think it's getting very exciting because we're starting to get some data. Um, I think it's way too early to draw conclusions. Um, I mean, we might make conclusions, but they could be the wrong ones. So um, to me, this is like, we're, we're finally starting to see some of the impact of the data collection that can inform decisions later on, but it's actually really early in the process. And um, I, I would hate to see any drastic policy decisions made based on just this at this point. I mean, this is just early data collection. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you, Sue. So if there are no other hands raised, oh, Ed's got his hands raised, and then Lisa. And I, sorry, I'm not sure which one came first. Well, this is Ed. Um, thank you, Sue. I, it's my opinion that one of the reasons production is so low is the lack of buildable lots. And when you take the cost of buildable lots today, the only way you can make the bottom line work is to build a very expensive home. Um, and I want to go back to uh, our first, you know, there were three areas that we redesignated to uh, low density residential during the first go around. One of them was off uh, Irving and Northwest Expressway. It's totally developed now. Um, Another one was Katrina Westers off uh, Gillum and Ayers, and it would be totally developed, but she's slowing down a little bit. The majority of it is. And the other area was Crow, and as was mentioned earlier, it's too expensive to get uh, utilities there. So when you take a look at the land that we already brought in and the fact that it's already almost totally developed, it's obvious to me that we do not have enough buildable lots. And that's one of the reasons the lots are so expensive, simple supply and demand. That's it for now. Thanks, Ed. And Lisa, and then Bill and then John. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to concur with what Sue said, that we're just beginning to collect the data. We're beginning to see trends that are um, driven by policy changes. John was talking about that earlier um, with various um, bills that have passed to encourage infill. And I would hate to see any kind of policy recommendations made at this time. Um, I have a lot of other thoughts, but I just wanted to concur with Sue about that and acknowledge what John had said earlier. Thanks, Lisa. Bill? Yeah, no, I, I agree entirely. And I think, you know, that my observation just about the small number of ADUs developed is really in the making the observation that, you know, people's worst fears and the NIMBYs who are saying that this is going to ruin everything, I think is unfounded. I don't think it's really you know, produce this groundswell, it may, you know, and it may be a lot more significant in the future, and hopefully it will. Um, and I think it's just a, a matter of some of these other, um, you know, making inferences about some of the other data that's been uh, presented before us. I would suggest one thing, Heather, is that <clears throat> when previously, in again, in talking about the, the efficiency measures and so forth, and how they kind of play out into these numbers that are reflected in these BLI charts, um, SDC uh, credits. The city does have uh, a policy of offering these SDC credits to build along corridors. And I can tell you that one of those big student housing projects has consumed all of that was budgeted this year. You know, so it is, it is not a panacea. The city is not budgeting properly for that to be an effective tool to be able to get non-student housing 
at higher densities along corridors, which is definitely a policy objective. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. John. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Sue and Lisa, you know, we're early on and, and, and I hope that policymakers keep that in mind because the way I could look at this is goes against what Ed's saying, right? The numbers that I see here show there's still, a, we projected for a lot more building on vacant and partially vacant land and it hasn't occurred. But what I hear from the home builders is it's not occurring because the prices are too high and the way to, the way to uh, get lower prices would be have more land available. Right, which means expand UGB. But the data doesn't show that. The data that shows that we don't need more land because the vacant land for low density isn't being built on to the extent that we thought it was going to be built on. So does that mean that we are going to be a more multi-unit community? Because that's the way it's, it's, the data is showing us right now. It's showing that the incentives that we're using lead towards more density on partially developed and developed lands and at higher densities than we had anticipated. So is the mix that we came to, in, that council came to back in 2012 of, you know, was it 55, 45, I think is what it was. Um, is that what we need to look at? Or do we need to and, and say, okay, we're wrong on that. We are going to be more of a multi-unit community or we're gonna have high priced homes on our vacant and partially vacant land. And, and I'm afraid that, that policymakers will be able to take this data and craft it into whatever position they want to push forward. And so us as the ETAC, I think when it comes down to our recommendation, we need to think about that, um, the message that we wanna put out saying kind of what Sue said, this is early, it's a snapshot, we're learning from it, but don't necessarily take this and use this as a hammer to drive through any particular agenda. Heather? Um, this is great. This is helping me as we think about what goes in, what's the overarching message that we wanna put in the report and in the executive summary. So this is super helpful. Um, we do talk a number of times as well in the report about how um, single family and multifamily are not on the same market. They don't, they're not on the same market waves. Um, and so they, they, single family follows a little bit more closer to what's going on in the economy and sometimes causes what's going on in the economy and, and vice versa. And then um, multifamily, I think is a little bit more of an up and down, it sounds like. And so, um, so that's what I think is really interesting about monitoring is that, um, this is our first report. You would think being eight years into our monitoring period, that would be enough time to draw some, some conclusions. And I think in some cases, the conclusion is we need to keep monitoring, um, we don't have enough data yet or, or, and or we need to look over a, non, a longer time period. Um, I also just want to flag that I would love to get into the density charts if we can, um, because that will free up our next meeting to um, circle back on the density charts where we need to, but also go into the employment charts. Wow. So Lisa had her hand up and then Sue, if we can be quick. Okay, I'll be quick. So in terms of um, policy, which I just said we shouldn't rush on, I do wonder again how the 
a city is looking at vacant commercial land and how easy it would, how easy the city could make it to rezone it for residential. And a case in point going on right now is the corner of Polk and 7th, the old bank there, what is it? I forget, Wells Fargo, I think it is, bank uh, that uh, um, the city is entertaining a proposal to turn it into another gas station. But here we're talking about infill. Why couldn't the city look toward its climate action plan and, and look toward those kinds of vacant commercial properties for uh, infill? So just to, um, at this point, this group is not doing policy. I just want to make sure. I know, you know I just want to, you know, bring it up yeah. as an example. Uh-huh, but that, but that is kind of like we were talking about earlier about development standards. And if you change those, those can become efficiency measures. Um, that's the same kind of thing, redesignating a property to get more, to require more housing essentially, because right now you can do housing in commercial, but it's not required. So if you redesignated it to require it to be um, housing, then that would be an efficiency measure for housing. So yeah, that's a policy decision for sure that um, could be considered as part of either other work like the climate work or as part of our housing capacity analysis moving forward. Yep, that's great. Uh, so I think it's really important, your comment, Heather, about context for this report and what else has to go in it to make it fully understandable, particularly to the policymakers. It's important to look backwards as well as to look forwards, um, forward, that we have to look at what have we had a shortage of? I mean, and where have there been opportunities that have not been taken advantage of? For instance, Franklin Boulevard. I mean, it's fantastic that all that's happening on Franklin Boulevard. That's where it should happen. It should have happened there 20 years ago, but there wasn't enough demand. Now there's enough demand. But I think, you know, we have to look backward too and say, what have we not done in the last 20 years? Why is that so much easier to do now than building a single family house? Um, so those, those kinds of pieces of information, I think, need to be a part of the report so that people have a better, a bigger context for it. Also, it makes sense to build huge multifamily apartment units right now. It makes financial sense to the investors and the developers who are doing it. It's a place where you actually can make money, where on a single family house right now, it's not easy. It's really not easy. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. So Heather, why don't we launch into the next area? Great, thank you. Um, and I can always email you all the update. Um, and like I said, we can carry this over to the next meeting. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to cut our conversation short. Um, so these are the charts that we Elena sent out. Um, today. And they take some digesting for sure. Um, but now we're going back. We're not really talking about acres. We're talking about the net density that we have seen, which actually, you know, is related um, that we've seen from new, the net new dwellings. Um, and so this one, um, this is a couple things I wanna make sure that I point out is that this is the net density for the entire project so or development site. So in the cases where um, it's a multifamily apartment complex and they're adding um, in the monitoring period, they just added one new building, but it's part of a larger um, development site those, the density is for the whole development site. So it's not the density of just the new building. It's the, and that's how we calculate density. You do it for the whole development site. And so what that means is that um, there are some group quarters type housing that the land use code requires us to do a density calculation for um, as nursing homes and assisted care facilities and single room occupancy um, our grouped quarters that we 
do do we do take um, the number of beds or rooms that are in those types of um, housing and then um, get an equivalent number of dwellings from that. So that's part of the density calculation. And I just want to point that out. It's not, it doesn't, I don't think it has a huge impact, but um, it is different from all of the discussion we've been having, which has been specifically focused on net new dwellings without group quarters. Um, but it makes sense to bring it in here. Um, so there are a couple group quarters where we don't do a density calculation. Dorms is one of those. So <laughs> just to be convoluted, uh, we are not bringing in all group quarters in the density calculation, just the ones that require you to do density calculation. Um, and frankly, that's part of what took us so long to get this um, information correct, um, is making sure we were having that information right. Um, so what you're seeing, like in all the other charts, is the density that has been achieved with the new dwelling so far compared to the average net density that we assumed over the 20 year period. Um, and so, for example, in low density residential, we've seen an average net density of 7.1. Um, compared to the 5.4 that we assumed for the 20 year period. So again, that's one of the things that we have to think about is that we are only eight years into the monitoring period, whereas the 5.4 is for dwellings over 20 years. Um, medium density residential, 14.3 compared to 15.4 is what we forecasted. Um, and as I've mentioned, the 15.4 represents the fact that we increased the minimum density that's required in the compatible R2 zoning, um, but that didn't happen until 2017. So a lot of the development that's coming in right now in MDR is older pre-existing approvals. Um, and so they weren't subject to the minimum density, the new, min the new higher minimum density. Um, HDR has been coming in 20, about 21% higher than what was forecasted. Um, we didn't do a forecast for commercial because we just assumed a certain number of units would happen on commercial land instead of saying 5.4 units would happen over this many acres of land. It was just a certain number of units would happen on commercial. Um, but what we've been seeing is 78.6, and I think during the UGB analysis, it was generally assumed that we would see high density residential densities, 32.6 on commercial, but we're definitely seeing higher than that, and, you know, that's, um, that's because of those taller apartment buildings that we've been seeing. And this one, again, I'm showing you this, but this is really just those two projects. <laughs> so it looks really high, but, um, but it's a little bit out of scale. Um, so this is kind of fun. Um, this is new data. We did not have this during the UGB analysis. This is the average net density of dwellings by housing type category. So single family detached, which you know includes ADUs, manufactured homes, single family attached, row, those are row houses, townhouses, two to four units. So we've got missing middle housing in here. Um, and then this is structures that are five or more dwellings in them. Um, so just uh, this does show housing, this does show density by housing type. Um, however, the way density is calculated, like I mentioned, it's calculated for the whole site. And so um, the density for the whole site was attributed to all of the different housing types that might have been happening on the property. So as an example, um, if we saw 18.4 um, density on a development site and it was a, well, that's a bad example actually. Um, 
that would be a good example. <laughs> um, if we saw, so we saw 82.8, but it was a mixture of um, maybe there was a, a standalone single family unit and then there, all the rest of them were five or more units on the same property. Um, that 82.8 would be attributed to both of those housing types. So it doesn't happen a lot um, because of the way that we've parsed this up where two to four dwellings is really two to four dwellings on one lot. It's not two to four dwellings only in a building. Um, but I just wanted to kind of make sure that that was clear. Um, and we don't really, because we didn't have this information before, we don't have anything to compare to, but this will be helpful, um, I think, going forward when we do things like code amendments that um, have an effect on the housing types that might be allowed um, in certain areas or um, those efficiency measures when we get to the efficiency measure discussion. Um, we, when you're making it easier to do certain housing types, you might be able to better understand what impact that would have on the overall density in that area. Um, this one is going back to our buildable lands inventory categories and just looking at the, um, the net density that we've seen on average on each of the plan, or sorry, each of the categories. So of all the vacant land, regardless of plan designation that had dwellings on it, what was the density that was achieved, the net density? And that was 9.2 units per acre. Um, I'm not sure how helpful this is really. Um, <laughs> we have it in case we need it. It seems like a good idea, but um, to me, it's a little, it would be more helpful to see the information broken out by plan designation, um, which is what we have here. So this is like the worst slides to end our meeting on because they have so much information on them. So I'm just gonna walk through this first slide and then let you all digest it. And then maybe we can come back at the next meeting and with your questions or comments about um, this stuff. But basically um, different from this one where low density residential, it's saying on all land in low density residential, we saw 7.1 dwellings per net acre. Um, now we're breaking that down further for low density residential by, and for all the plan designations, by the elevation of the lot. So is it above or below 900? The slope of the lot, is it above or below 5%? And then the pseudo lot size, so that's those buildable acres of the lot are below one acre, one to five acre or five plus acre. So you remember this from the conversations with Thea about how we did our capacity analysis. Um, each one of these combinations, LDR less than 900, less than five um, and less than an acre had its own density assumption for it. Um, and so when you're looking at this data, know that there were a few instances, 63, I think, where um, the, the tax lot um, was, the tax lot that the building permit came in on um, was not made up of the same combinations during the BLI. So it was made of two different lots. And let's say one of them was in this combination. So it was under 900 and it was small and it was flat. And one of them was over 900 and it was small and it was flat. And so in those cases, what we did was we attributed the density to the one that had the largest area of the lot. We had no way to really split it out. 
So with that, <laughs> um, I think it makes sense because it's 7.30 of this. It's not really, I don't think, fair to go through um, these additional tables, um, if that makes sense to the group. I think that we should just pick this up with um, your questions. If you can go ahead and review these tables and then come with questions about density for next time. And then hopefully we'll have um, employment building permits to go through as well. Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, do we need a motion to adjourn the meeting? I think you can adjourn it, but if everyone, I mean, I think, sorry, Sue, go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, thanks, Heather. This was a, a, a lot of information, and it'll be interesting to see how much we can roll over into the start of our next meeting. Um, anything further in terms of schedule that you want to last comments, Heather? Um, yeah, I just will say um, that I'll email this out, but um, you know, we're, as I forecasted last time, still meeting twice in November and maybe twice in December. Happy holidays, everyone. Um, and uh, we really are pushing to get you a draft of the report by the November 4th meeting. So that's, that's um, so we appreciate your patience. We appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing, so. Heather, one, one more quick question. On one of those last slides, you're referring to them still as multifamily and single family. Isn't there a new terminology that we're trying to use? And should we, that into the yeah, we talked about this a couple meetings ago. I am not incorporating that new terminology yet. Um, we need to get through this. Okay. Um, and frankly, I think it'd be good for that to be a little bit further down the review process. If there's going to be changes we're going to need to make to these charts anyway. There's actually a bunch that you all requested and advised that we haven't even had time to make yet. And so I think once it's looking like um, those are the terms that we're going to be using, let's do it all at once because there's so many um, housing type um, right. charts. Right. Yeah. What is the Thank what you. is the term? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I. Yeah, I've been trying to like wait until it's a little bit more solidified because all I can think about is how many things I'm going to have to change once those terms get solidified. <laughs> Excuse me, Heather, going back. So we have uh, meetings on the 4th and the 18th of November. And where are they in December as well? 2nd and 16th. OK, thanks. And these next steps are in your uh, the, the email that um, and then I was sent out earlier today. Yes, I missed that. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, everybody. And thanks. again, Good night. thanks to Great job, staff. Staff. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for for taking over. <laughs> hey. um, I'm going to email you a question, Heather. Um, or let's. You just got a half a second. You know, I was thinking. Um, we talk about efficiency measures. I wonder if it'd be useful to also think about identifying what you might call friction factors in development. It sort of came up in a number of sub conversations today, or um, just to help policymakers think about that. And again, maybe that even doing that is kind of a policy thing. But um, if we're going to talk about efficiency measures, it might be useful to talk to think about identifying. <laughs> Uh, friction factors, you know, community resistance, uh, oh. cost of infrastructure, just to give them names um, and begin that discussion. So that's great. Um, yeah, I could see that being part of when we're considering new efficiency measures or or even continuing efficiency measures. Um, I don't want to call it pros and cons, but it is kind of like 
is there more friction with this one or, you know, and we did that a little bit by um, proposing and adopting um, MUPTI for downtown because we knew we had a need for more multifamily housing and there's less friction um, with getting it downtown because there's already services, people expect taller density, taller buildings downtown. Um, it meets our climate goals. Um, yeah. yeah, but that's a great, I have not heard that term. Um, so that'll be helpful um, to think about it in that context. Okay, good. And I thought I'd mention that your, your Zoom presence is very nice. It's very professional looking. And I don't know if it's the camera you use because you're in focus, but your background is not. Are you aware of that? Yep, there's a, um, in Zoom, you can blur your background. And oh. so I just do that because I have a lot going on in my background. <laughs> uh, good, I'll, I'll have to look for that setting. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. You bet, bye. Bye.